It was very different in the beginning, so different that we can barely get our head around that kind of context and the situation those people were in. But it's important for us to consider what it was really like in those first two to three centuries with the followers of Jesus after his death. Today, that's what I want to talk about. And as I talk about that, be sure to subscribe to your chan this channel and click the bell so you're notified of future videos. So let's start with some basics. Jesus was a Palestinian Jew who had a small band of followers that he taught. And because of what he taught, he ended up being crucified, capital punishment at the hands of the Roman Empire. Now, living in the Roman Empire was not some glorious thing. Well, not for most people, for the citizens of Rome, but they were few and far between. The vast majority of people fed the rest of the empire. When Rome would go in to an area and conquer it, the first thing they typically did was go in and crucify people randomly. They would gather up people and execute them publicly, and they used crucifixion because it was public, it was torturous, it took a long time. People would often hang on the cross for at least a day. And then they'd leave the bodies on the cross where they'd be eaten by dogs and buzzards and whatever till the bodies would rot. And this was traumatizing for people. And not only did they have the trauma of seeing loved ones executed in this way, but then the Romans would pull together bunches of people from a newly conquered area and they'd ship them to a different part of the empire where they'd use them as slave laborers, laborers. And it was then these people who built the Roman roads and the, and the arenas and the aqueducts and the baths and all the things we associate with the glories of Rome. And this was all done on fear and terror. Yes, the people of the conquered areas got the roads and the baths and things but at really a very high price. Within the Roman system, there was one person anointed. The anointed was Caesar, and, he, and Caesar was anointed because by becoming the emperor, he was on his way to become included in the pantheon of gods. Here come the followers of Jesus. They're primarily people who have been displaced by the Roman occupation. They are, typically are not Roman citizens. They're typically uneducated laborers. And they say, we're following Jesus, and Jesus is our anointed one. And this Jesus brings us peace. Jesus is the good shepherd, cares for us and brings us peace, peace in our heart and safety with each other. So they were setting up a countercultural kind of dynamic where they used language that was common in the Roman Empire, but to describe Jesus. Today, we talk about Jesus Christ. That word Christ means the anointed one. It's not a last name. It means the anointed one. These early followers of Jesus met in small groups. Some groups were very small, where two or three are gathered. Other groups were 13, 14, or 15 but they weren't large. And they met and they shared meals together. That was their primary focus. They'd gather and create a community where there was a sense of safety and belonging because they didn't have that in the wider world. So they came together for that fellowship and that connection. They shared their food and they shared stories of their teacher. And they had many more stories than we have today. There were stories that were handed down by oral tradition, but in time, some people began to write these stories, create gospels and other documents, many more than what we have in the, in the Bible today. And even in the last hundred years, more of these stories have been found. And they circulated and nourished people. And it was here that they had their community. And in these communities, all were created equal. Remember, Paul writes that there's neither slave nor free, male nor female, but all are one. And Paul demonstrated this, even in his letters greeting women who were leaders. You know, some churches today say that women were never leaders in the church. Well, they certainly were in the first few centuries. 
There was Chloe and Thecla and Salome, just to name a few. All these people gathered together in their small groups. And these groups were all different from each other. They didn't have a need to be the same as each other. But it was here they learned together and created a life together. And it was a really beautiful thing. This continued until the 300s. First in 313, the Edict of Milan came along and made Christianity, and Romans created that name, Christianity. These early followers didn't call themselves that. Christianity was a term to say, oh, you're anointed one, we killed him. Well, these people they called Christians, they made them legal so they wouldn't be persecuted anymore. And a few decades later, Christianity became the religion of the empire. And through this, the 300s, is where we see the, the intellectuals getting involved in Christianity, who wrote the creeds and the dogma and decided what books would be in the Bible and all those kinds of things. That's when the religious structure started. And in response to that, many people wanted to hang on to what had been. So they left the institutional church that was forming. And when they left, they went to the desert of Sinai, they went north to what's now Germany, they went outside of the Roman Empire to lead their life in, in, in small communities and to share with each other, to share meals, and to share stories of Jesus. Many of us have left the institutional church. Some of us who have left grew up in the church and valued many things, but we found that the teachings of Jesus didn't jive with what the institutions had become. And that's very much the experience of the early church. So I think it's important for us to consider what it was really like in those early centuries, those first two to three centuries, where people focused on sharing meals together. Not a symbolic meal, not a little wafer in one little cup, but full meals where people could share together and, and celebrate together and build their lives together and share faith and be inspired by each other. In my next video, I'm gonna talk about what some of that means for the future of Christianity. So be sure to stay tuned. And in the meantime, subscribe to this channel, like the video, share it with others, leave me some comments, and know that I appreciate the time you spend on Spirituality Beyond Borders. Have a great day.